fuck am I watching right now? Hello, welcome back to the True Ground Guys podcast. I'm Lauren. And I'm Michael. We're back on the free feed. Just uh, coming off Patreon last week. And Halloween season, man. We're going to do another That's crazy right. episode. Uh, this one, The Devil's Disciple, is the uh, moniker for this serial killer. We're going back across the pond. Um, this guy, oh, man. To the UK. Legit psychopath. His murders were insane and all over the map. Mm-hmm. Like, just like this type of guy that would just straight throw someone off a bridge like just be walking on a bridge and like i'm just gonna kill this yeah. guy and just like on a whim just throw someone off a bridge or just absolutely preying on any weakness he could find oh yeah this guy I'm like you just... like definitely well said because he definitely targeted uh you know easy easy to kill targets elderly women mm-hmm. homeless people and and it really just was a legit psychopath though like the type of guy that where you, when it comes to trial time you're like I don't know how culpable this guy is. He's literally insane. It reminds also, me a bit but, of Herbert Mullen. Do you remember him? Like he was just like yes. his brain was just like completely gone from all the all the yeah. uh, drugs he did. Except this guy but was this like guy that also the robbed people kid. too, though. Yeah, he robbed people. There was motive there. Yeah, he knew what he was doing. A little bit. Um, but I think that was that was just extra. You know what I mean? That wasn't his intention. Yeah. I think that did help him pick his victims. You know, it's like, well, if I'm going to kill this, I'm not going to kill this poor elderly person when I can kill this rich elderly person, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And ransack their house as well. I do think it played into his victim, uh, you know, his choosing of the victims, Mm -hmm. but I don't think it was his main motive. I think he was just a psychopath because this guy checks all the boxes. Yeah. You know, the whole McDonald triangle is, it's a full triangle here for sure. Yeah. He's got them all. (laughs) Yep. So let's get into it, man. The devil's disciple for Halloween season. Uh, good timing right. we got a person to shout out for the suggestion uh, after the other side of the intro all right here we go uh, albany you ever been albany albany yes it was at albany in 1970 1980 uh, 86 i think it was at albany for a short period of time no i wasn't there too long actually uh, i didn't particularly like the control lock yeah. Not anymore. They've, they're back on the keys. I thought they were on like only six at a time, slop out. And the riots. Well, I got there just after the riots. I mean, do you feel at the time of the offence you were a psychopath or behaving psychopathically? From the point of view of somebody who is supposedly using that label to enjoy taking human life, there was never, ever any suggestion in my mind that I was ever a psychopath if one used to use that criteria. I could have perhaps understood some people being rather uncertain as to whether or not I was. But I certainly have never considered myself psychopathic if one takes the criteria that one gets a special enjoyment out of killing. No such enjoyment have I ever had. I have never found any pleasure out of any such thing. All right, so this week's suggestion came from a list, a new listener, Tyler P., who shot us a message on Instagram, said he's listened to 100 episodes in a week. Is that what it was, that ratio? Ooh, yeah. All right, Pretty Tyler. impressive. You're going through it. I was it, trying man. to do the math. I'm like, I think that's like three and a half episodes a day, approximately. Uh, wait, that can't be right. No. What was it a month? Was it 100, 100 a month? a week? It was 100 a month. That's what it was, 100 <laughs> a month. Oh, 100 Which the math month. would okay, add up if you better. do it that way. 30 yes that sounds more three. that sounds more doable yeah <laughs> yeah 100 in a week yeah, either would be way 10 a day or actually more right showing my math here showing my math skills yeah right and it depends i mean some people work long hours man yeah. you know that true you know you work a tw- 10 12 hour shift you can knock out some damn audio especially if you're by yourself yeah you know there was a time sure. where my job i drove around all day alone and i, I yep. could easily listen to 10 hours of podcasts if i if i wanted to Oh yeah, or knock out an audio book in a day. Oh 10, yeah, twelve hour audio book speed it sped up. Mm-hmm. You know, hundred percent knock that shit out quick. Yeah. So All there, right. uh, he also suggested the book for this case, which is only available in paperback, and it's called Psychopath by John Pennycate. Um, was not able mm-hmm. to get the book and read that because it was a it was a very thick leather bound paperback book. Um, 
Okay. Uh, we do audible. Might be worth looking into though. Yeah, we do audible books for the the show sometimes. Um, but we have a week to prepare for these episodes, and then we're on to the next episode. So there's only so much time, and I'm right. I'm not a speed reader, so there is still a ton exactly. of information out there. Um, I'm sure there's some details in the book that if if you are if you listen to this episode and you're still intrigued by this case and want to learn more, there's a couple books that yeah. we'll suggest throughout this. Um, there's also a well done, um, uh, documentary, or I guess if you could call it that a special done that we'll have a link for below that I mm -hmm. watched, um, really well done. And that's where a lot of this information comes from as well. And I think the authors of these books were in the documentary. So you get some of their take on it as well. And some of the details that they did a lot of research to learn. Awesome. Yep. So as we mentioned, All we're right. going back across the pond over to, uh, Jolly England for this case, uh, in the seventies. <laughs> They had their own serial killers in the 70s. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just the U.S. Apparently. Yeah. I know, right? Yeah. They, they were everywhere in the 70s, yeah. apparently. And we'll start out in 1972 with a rash of crimes going on in affluent areas of London. Areas like Chelsea and Knightsbridge were suddenly engulfed in a wave of petty crimes. And they were known to be uh, some of the you know wealthiest areas in London, full of luxury shops, high-end restaurants, and the areas saw a sudden massive unexplained rise in muggings, robberies, and handbag snatchings. So there was, mm. they had a predator uh, amongst them. Yeah. And these attacks seemed to specifically target elderly women. And the, unident the unidentified attacker would seemingly befriend these women and gain access to their homes before committing the crimes, which makes it that much worse. He would earn their trust Absolutely. probably i could just imagine them walking down the street and like they're carrying something and he offers to carry it for them and they're yeah you know they want to see the bet oh look at this nice yeah. young man who wants to help me and next thing you know he's murdering right. them in their flat yeah he's offering to do things around their house and mm -hmm. next thing you know he's in there mm -hmm. with permission yeah and they seem yeah. to escalate because initially they were mostly just muggings robberies and then ultimately they would turn into brutal murders by 1974 and so let's start out with one of those. On February 14th, 1974, 84-year-old Isabella Griffith was physically assaulted, strangled, and stabbed in her home in Chelsea. And now police are seeing these, these petty crimes turn into cold-blooded murder. And things are escalating. Right. And police were unable to identify the perpetrator and the muggings uh, of the petty thefts continued in the area as well. Then 13 months later, on March 10th, 1975, another elderly woman named Adele Price was also murdered in her Chelsea home by someone who had entered her home by invitation. So not a break in. Mm. So this, this woman had let the, you know, her murderer into her home and right. uh, in a crazy uh, moment, like what you'd see in a film or something, uh, her granddaughter was coming home at the time and without knowing passed right by the killer as he left the premises. So she's like going up oh, the stairs, man. he's coming down the stairs. They have that brief look at each other. And she later was like, that was definitely the guy that killed my grandmother. And that I didn't was know the it. Guy. Yep. God, that's so disheartening. Mm -hmm. And police were concerned that the crime spree and the murders of the two women were linked, but they had no promising suspects. Um, and this takes us to uh, one of the more famous aspects of this crime, the murder of Father Korean. He was a, uh, you know, a priest, and we'll get to that in a minute, but this happens in a different area outside of London, Shorn, which is a quiet affluent area, affluent area of England, east of London, near Gravesend. And back in 1975, a priest named Father Anthony Crean resided there and was well known to the small village community. It's a beautiful place. Like after watching and learning about this place, it just seemed like one of those that uh, places I'd like to visit if I ever went over there. Right. Yeah, that was that was kind of a trademark for a lot of these crimes. They were in very nice affluent areas. He knew he knew where to pick his victims yeah. for sure. This place looks. That's why I was saying earlier, pretty, robbery is a part of the motive. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, and Shorn looks like it's a very rural kind of uh, farming, almost like it looked like there's a lot of people with mm -hmm. horses and things like that. It just looks like a beautiful area. Um, Lots of places to hide a body. Small population. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> So yeah, he resided there uh, and oversaw the home called the Mort House, which uh, about 12 nuns resided in. And he was known for his kind heart, willingness to help the needy, and his Jack Russell Terrier, aptly named Jack, that followed him everywhere he went. So it just really right. paints a picture of this priest walking around this small village, his Jack Russell right. Terrier, Jack, following him around. Um, and everyone knew him, and he, like we said, he was willing to help anyone, and in this instance, helped the wrong person and allowed a uh you know a psychopath to come into his life 
and he paid dearly for it. So on March 21st, 1975, yeah. Father Crean uh, was found brutally murdered in his home in Shorn. Now, it was said the police mm -hmm. got reports that he'd not returned home, but he was found in his home. So I'm wondering if he was supposed to be away and then he was he was upstairs in the bathroom. So I think he was in the home when people were looking for him. And when the police arrived, okay. they said that nuns were screaming because um, they had found him. He had been attacked oh. with an axe in a frenzied attack uh, with the weapon being found at the scene. So the axe was left at the scene and investigators found him in his bathtub upstairs with it full of water and blood with his body, body floating and his head basically split open. Mm. Um, so God, that's brutal, man. Yeah. And do you think he's trying to make a point here? Like as far as this killer, this escalation, killing a priest in particular, I think he definitely added to it. I or, think he liked the shock. And or do you think this priest was, yeah, I think so. I think he kind of got off on that. Mm -hmm. And then also, I guess this priest was maybe somewhat wealthy in this area. Yeah. Or at least he thought so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as we mentioned, we would later find out that the priest had allowed this killer into his life. He, right. He probably also got off on taking out such a prominent, important figure in this neighborhood. Gave him power, I'm sure. Gave him power. I mean, we're talking about yeah, a person who, right? it, as a child, tortured animals. He definitely enjoyed the power yeah. of having control over another living soul, you know. Right. But taking out like a community's priest, everyone's going to know about yeah. that. And you see what I'm saying? That's mm -hmm. going to be news. That's going to be all over the town. It's not like taking out some, you know, shut in elderly woman who no one knows. And she hasn't this been guy, out for, you know, years. Doesn't this guy remind you a bit of like a British version of uh, Richard Ramirez? The way he would, you know, target elderly women. And there was a shock and awe factor to it. And also a robbery aspect. Yes. And ran Anyone randomness. thought was an easy target. Yeah. Yeah. He wasn't looking for a challenge. He, he, I don't think he was really even looking for much sexual gratitude unless he just got that from the killings. No, it didn't seem like there was a sexual did. element, although there was a, well, there's some quotes that he had later about like how he would sit with the bodies typically for at least an hour after they were dead. And just, he, he got, he but had, not, he had a sense of calm and peace come over him when he, after he had done yeah. what he had done. And like with father Crean, apparently this killer had sat there and, and stared at him in the bathtub for, for an hour. Which is just yeah, and it brought like a piece over him. Yeah. That is terrifying. So uh, an investigating police officer desperate to find those responsible remembered an incident that had occurred some months earlier involving a man in his early 20s named Patrick McKay. Patrick McKay uh, was, uh, I believe, about 21 at the time that this investigator had crossed paths with him, and he had befriended Father Crean, meeting him at a bar called the Rose and Crown Pub, which after looking this place up, it's one of those that's been there forever. And it's like, if I were to go over to England, I definitely want to go check this place out. It looks like your, your typical London old school like pub. Yeah. It looks awesome. Yeah. And father Crean <laughs> frequented this place and that's where they had met each other. Uh, I'm imagining father Crean seeing this troubled young man and approaching him and offering guidance. And obviously we see how that worked out, unfortunately. Right. Um, however, Patrick mm -hmm. later broke into father Crean's home and stole a check, which he would then forge in cash. And although Father Crean tried to persuade the police not to do so, McKay was arrested and prosecuted at the time. He was subsequently ordered to pay compensation, but never did. And I'm sure Father Crean was not hounding him about getting his money back for that or whatever. He was just wanted what was right. best for this kid. Um, he's trying to set an example, and he's trying to save souls. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and, and show his show his ability to forgive and forget. Exactly. The incident, exactly. however, caused a rift between McKay and Father Crean, and the former had returned to London. So McKay returns to London, and Father Crean maybe thinks that's that's it. Um, yeah. Obviously, it was not. The way in which McKay had reacted, however, to the investigator when he'd been charged for that, you know, that stolen check stuck out to this this officer, Ken Tappington, who was interviewed in this series that I, uh, not the series, but the special that I, I mentioned earlier and the link is below. He was interviewed in this. Right. And uh, he said that the way that this young man reacted when they charged him with that stolen check was alarming. He said that he scared me basically. Like he, sh he shown that he had rage inside of him and was not right. And so immediately mm -hmm. when he found this horrific scene of uh, father cream being murdered, the first thing that came to his mind was this young man, Patrick McKay. And he thought it must have right. been him. Um, and also it, it matched up that a young man fitting Patrick McKay's description had been seen in the area of the murder by multiple witnesses. So now they had a very strong lead right away. So um, following Father Crean's murder, Detective uh, Tappington tasked two of his officers 
to locate McKay. Um, so he would, he would have two of his officers track down McKay's whereabouts and it would take a little bit. They'd have to do some research and tracking and they would ultimately find McKay at a family member's home in London. And immediately, uh, when they, he was sitting on the couch and when they brought him out almost immediately, he confessed to the murder. That's surprising. Yeah. That's very surprising. That's not a good sign. Unless he wanted credit most for serial it. serial killers, well, I guess, but most serial killers don't confess to early murders. This means that this man's been at it for a while and has probably already come to terms with he's never going to stop, maybe even feeling a little bit of guilt. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Or maybe just tired of living this with this life, with this condition. Possibly. The fact that he just gave himself up. Maybe he has a men- mindset of nothing's going to stop me unless I get stopped. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, maybe he's already to that point. Mm-hmm. So after his arrest of Father Crean, he also began confessing to a slew of other murders. And obviously the you know the local media was all over this. This guy is a mm-hmm. you know obviously headlines all over this horrific murder of a priest. And now they bring in this young, uh, disturbed young man, and he's confessing right. to all sorts of murders. And there actually is like they're able to track down things that fit the murders as well, even though some of them are, uh, they weren't even known. So McKay's fingerprints would be taken after his arrest, which would found, would be found to match those found at the scene of Adele Price's murder. Uh, one of the two elderly women that we mentioned earlier, um, jewelry and silver fountain pens were found in McKay's home, which had come from robberies he had committed in the Chelsea and Belgravia areas. Um, so now they know that he had been the burglar of that spring of, of burglaries in those affluent areas. And Mm -hmm. they must feel good getting him off the streets when they know that he's been causing havoc all over areas of London. Absolutely. Especially in these upper class areas. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there was a lot of pressure. Yeah. There was a lot of pressure. There's a lot of influence in those communities typically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The police were feeling it. So yeah, they probably felt like heroes at this point. Yeah. And McKay would even take detectives to an area of Clapham where he said he had thrown a knife he used in his murders and the police began to investigate McKay. And he was found to have committed many other unsolved murders and crimes in the London area. And we'll get into more of those. But first, let's get into his background. Patrick McKay was born September 25th, 1952, and shares a birthday with Will Smith, T.I., and Mark Hamill. Wow, what a crew. Any thoughts on any of them? Things have been pretty uh, quiet for Will Smith since the uh, the slap heard around the world. Since the slap. <laughs> yeah, the slap really, uh, it, it really put a dent in his legacy, huh? Man, I didn't think it was going to be this detrimental, but yeah, yeah he's kind of went into hiding since then. It was shit. not a good look. No, it was not. But, I mean, all that he's accomplished, and then this slap just like... <laughs> Wiped everything out. I think ultimately Damn. the slap will, will be forgotten, and then like his movies, the films that he's know. done. I would <laughs> hope not... for his sake. I hope so, yeah. yeah. I hope so, too. But Mark Hamill, a legend. T.I., a legend in the hip-hop community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Good dudes. Both. Good dudes overall. Yeah. Um, and he was born in Middlesex, England, but grew up in Dartford. Um, and his parents were Harold McKay, a Scottish accountant, and Marion McKay, a woman of Creole descent from Guyana. Which first thing that comes Guyana? to mind, first thing that comes to mind, of course, is Jonestown, one of my favorite episodes we ever mm-hmm. did, one of my favorite cases to study, Jim Jones. Oh, that so one good. we did get like a sixteen-hour audio book or something on the road to Jonestown, one of the best books I've ever read. Highly recommend it. Yes. If you haven't heard our episode on Jonestown, check that out. Yes. Um, Please. But it's interesting that his mother came from that background, and then you learn that he later became obsessed with Nazism and thought he was this uh, Aryan god or something. And he's meanwhile, he's right. a quarter black. Oh, yeah. I guess they didn't have DNA tests back then. Yeah, no 23andMe. <laughs> no. Fortunately, that would really him. burst his bubble, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, his two sisters were born later in 1954 and 1957, so he had two younger sisters. Um, and his father, Harold, had gone through a traumatic time during World War II. It plays a big role in Patrick's upbringing. He had become an aggressive alcoholic as a result, his father. He would frequently beat uh, his wife and Patrick as well. And I've heard mixed things as far as how he treated the daughters. Some say, some sources I read said that he beat the daughters as well. Others say that he spared them of the beatings and it was mainly just targeted towards his wife and his son. Right. And he also allegedly gave too many details about what he had experienced while at war to his young son, giving him these sto- these graphic this, horror stories yeah. of World War II. 
and this is another link, like you said, to Richard Ramirez. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Yes. That 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 cousin. cousin that he had mm -hmm. that was the war veteran and showed him the photos of people that he'd killed. Mm -hmm. Like that played a huge role yeah. on Richard Ramirez and at a vital age. And, you know, he was ten when he was seeing these photos. Yep. So yeah, dude, that's a very formative age. Mm -hmm. This can't can't say this didn't play a role. And then also the abusive father too. Yep. Who knows? Maybe his father had some of the same tendencies that he had. He just didn't act on them as much, you know, as Patrick did. Mm -hmm. No, no. Maybe that kind of that anger, that hostility was passed down. Yeah. Yeah. He would uh, take it out, take out his frustrations on young Patrick and his mother, physically abusing them both. And in 1962, when Patrick was 10 years old, his father would be on his way to work uh, on the train and die from a heart attack. And you know, the alcoholism, alcoholism may have played a role in it. He was frequently drunk and I'm sure it took its toll on his body, but he had allegedly yep. told young Patrick before he left for work that day to, uh, remember to be good is what he said. Those were his last words to Patrick, which stuck out mm -hmm. and Patrick did not respond well. He did not remember. Well, yeah, well, no. it did, it, it, he did not respond well to his father's death um he didn't go to the funeral due to his mother not wanting him to because of the way that he had he had uh developed a fantasy that harold was still alive always carrying a photo with him and basically filling his shoes as the abusive uh tyrant of the home it said Man, that he, isn't that weird it said that at 10 years old he became like the, the new father of the home and he took over his spot and that you know every dad has their own chair took over that chair and began immediately abusing his mother and his two sisters. That is that's absurd. That's a that's a weird response to an abusive father. Typically, you know, the son has harbored hatred. I feel like mm -hmm. towards their abused father, their abusing father, or maybe maybe it sadness. seemed as though he looked but up the fact to him. That somehow. he looked up to him. Yeah. yeah, that's creepy. Yeah. Have you seen the show The Patient at all with Steve Carell? No. You should check that out. It's on Hulu. Steve Carell, it's a serious thing, but Steve Carell is a therapist and he has a patient who is a serial killer. And like this, this kid is like trying to stop. He's not a kid. He's probably like in his late twenties, mm -hmm. early thirties, but he's trying to stop killing. And so he in, elicits the help of Steve Carell, but then shit kind of gets a little crazy. He becomes kind of obsessive over the therapist and whatnot. It's it's a really tense. It sounds show. a little if bit like love... this. Is this your transition from The Sopranos? Because you're Jonesing and you need, because that sounds so similar to The Sopranos. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't even touch Sopranos, bro. Don't even get me started. Come on. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, in a, I'm like, it. yeah, now I'm in a dark cloud of no more Sopranos. So I felt the same way, dude. That's where like when it was over, I was like, right? damn, what am I going to do every evening? Like, this is my nightly routine <laughs> watching this show. <laughs> I know, like that. That is some good television. If you have, or if you're still holding out on Sopranos, highly recommend it, Pete. Yeah, man, you're you're one of the highly lucky ones that but can the patient, binge the whole thing all the way through. And just, exactly, and it's so good. But the patient is really good too, and it's still on TV. So I don't know how long it's going to go. I think there's maybe nine episodes available on Hulu, and it's a quick binge because they're only like twenty something minutes a piece. Mm -hmm. So, but they're tense the whole time. You talk about like slow, tense burns, and then there's crazy shit that happens. And so, does it follow? It's, it's pretty... if, does it follow around the patient that goes and kills people? And sometimes, okay. yeah. Yep. Nice. Yeah, it becomes pretty, pretty immersive. Honestly, I, I'm kind of hooked on it now. I can't wait for the new episode to come out. Nice. So it's pretty good. Yeah. So he was, uh, young Patrick was struggling to, uh, understand his father's death. Didn't want to believe that he had, because he just went to work and then he didn't come back and he was told that he, you know, yeah. that he died, but didn't want to believe and then he it. didn't go to the funeral. Didn't go to the funeral. So he never saw his body. Yeah. Maybe he a bad idea on truly... his mother's part. No closure. Yeah. Maybe you should have given him some closure, allow him to mourn, allow him to see the reality at yeah. 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Maybe he needs to see that reality. And like, I don't know, and maybe his, that would have helped him. His mother had some issues of her own. She, allow she kind of allowed his behavior you know he's 10 years old and she's allowing him to beat her and her and her her daughters mm. and every time he would be sent off to an institution which happens a lot coming up she would basically want him back and start uh, pleading with these institutions to send him home and then he would go right back to beating them mm. again and so you know kind of what we've seen in the past with todd colehep and a lot of these you know these psychopaths the mother enabled their behavior to an extent yeah, a mother's love, am I right? Yeah. It's damn impressive. Yeah. 
So he would spend his teenage years in and out of men's mental homes uh, and institutions, and it's observed that he enjoyed torturing animals. He would kill birds, which there we go. which he would then pin to the road and then watch as they were run over. And at one point, he killed the family tortoise by putting it on a bonfire and burning Jesus. it alive and then threw it over a fence afterwards. Some God very way. troubling signs. Yes, very. These are some very alarming signs. Yeah. Also, what family has a tortoise? That's kind of, it's kind of strange. I uh, there's been a few. Yeah. I've known some people that have had tortoises. Actually, really? we had a tortoise. I, yeah, growing up, I had a tortoise. Yeah, you had a tortoise. I had a tortoise. Just a big old tortoise just running around the would, backyard. Yeah, or... out in the desert, it would still hibernate. It would. Uh, we had a, a dog house on the side of the house, and we built built like a little burrow <laughs> underneath it so he could go in there and hibernate. And then one uh, winter, he just never came out, and like we don't know what happened. If something went under there and got him, or what. You know, a dog or a cat or something got him out, but how big was he? How big? Pretty was big. He? He's like the size of really? a chihuahua. Oh, pretty good sized tortoise. Okay, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I guess so. I was thinking like one of those big desert tortoises. You know, it's oh, like no, size not like, like one of the ones that you could is, ride you know? on. No, those hundred year old ones. <laughs> yeah, there's a place in Vegas. What's that aquarium off of Maryland? It's been there forever. Sequest. It's kind of like a. I think, yeah, Sequest. Yeah. And sometimes you go in there and they'll have a giant tortoise just walking around. Damn it. Like we went there. Uh, I took the kids there like, a, you know, two months ago and that, there was no no, yeah. no giant tortoise, unfortunately. But they did have some cool shit in there. What? Yeah. Damn. They got, yeah, when we went, it was super cool because I thought he was a statue. You can, sit sit statue. You. You can ha- go, you can pay five bucks and have the bird, like go into the little yeah. cage while the birds get all over your kids. And yeah, they had sharks. They on you and stuff. It's, yeah. it's good times. They had, they had some cool no, stuff. <laughs> But yeah, the tortoise, when it was walking around, I thought it was a statue when I first went in there and that thing started moving. I was like, holy shit, that thing is massive. Like if it wanted to, it could just snap your ankle for sure. <laughs> it could just come. Just... <laughs> I mean, but it's super chill. It's yeah. just walking around. Apparently they trust it that much. Right. Pretty docile creatures. Yeah. So young Patrick was uh, uh, described as a little terrorist by his friend Roland Hayes. So he had a, a friend named Roland Hayes who was interviewed in this uh, documentary that I watched. And he yeah. described him as a little terrorist. Um, he said there was, you know, there was always little troublemakers around. There was good kids, bad kids. And he was one of the bad ones, if not the worst. He said that he would mm-hmm. uh, terrify other school children and throw extreme fits of uh, tempers and rage. Um, he said that there would be times where little girls would be standing around talking and Patrick would run up and blindside hit them, knocking them to the ground, making them cry Holy and shit. then just kind of run away and laugh. God, what an asshole. Yeah. He also spoke about a time that he and Patrick were walking home from school and they went up this hill into the woods and Patrick found a, a flower petal that was shaped like a bell, peed in it, and then drank mm-hmm. it out just for just to kind of shock Ronald. So already getting See, off. See, this is what I was talking about. Like when he killed the priest, this is what I was talking about with the shock factor thing. Yeah. You know, that's how, that's the kind of shit that escalates right there. You know like what? You just I didn't wanna... even think about the connection. He definitely gets off on the shock factor of things, but yeah. Yes absolutely it's like and then the older he got the more shocking his behavior had to be mm-hmm. because he got jaded to it as well yeah but yeah he just wanted to see what people would do he wanted to raise some eyebrows mm-hmm. and he definitely did that through his life yeah ronald ronald said that patrick uh would frequently when they'd be walking around run into shops and steal items and then run back out um <laughs> and the older he got the worse he became and the more his behavior deteriorated he was volatile, mm-hmm. and it seems as though he was being provoked any, in any way. Uh, he, if he was provoked, he would become angry, and uh, he, uh, he would often react to the events in an extreme way. And he was diagnosed later as having a psychotic disorder. On one occasion, when he was 12, uh, he kicked his sister and mother out of the family home, and wasn't, it wasn't until the police arrived that they were allowed back into the home. And as we mentioned, he would be in, wow. and, at, in and out of insti- institutions, uh, and it would start at the age of 13 after he set fire to a Catholic church. There's some more, uh, there's some more shock and awe there. And also uh-huh. it seemed like he liked to fuck with the, you know, the church system and religion. It, it, yeah, he did. Then again, a little, little bit of Richard Ramirez there, you know, same thing. He likes to be the oh, antichrist yeah. or the, you know, act like he's working with the he devil. Did. Right, he didn't quite declare it the way that Richard did, but his actions speak pretty loud. Mm -hmm. Yep. (laughs) No joke. Uh, McKay's mother eventually moved the family to Gravesend from Dartford, which Gravesend, very close to uh, where the priest was later murdered. So he knew that area because that's where he, he, as a teen, his family had moved there. 
But of course, yeah. family life did not approve and the, uh, improve, and the police were called to the home as frequently as four times a week due to Patrick's extreme tantrums and fits of anger and beating of his Jesus. mother and sisters. A female officer named Amy Tapp worked in Gravesend at the time and responded to the calls. And she was later interviewed, like in court. And she said, you know, because she had this knack for calming him down, something about her presence, she was able to usually mm -hmm. bring him down a, a notch. Um, right. But she was very disturbed by him, uh, as most were that ever came across him. Yeah, naturally. He said he later said that he allegedly tried to kill a younger boy than himself when he was a teen and later said that he would have succeeded had he not been restrained. So he was trying to at one point trying to strangle a young boy when he was in his teens and was stopped by others. Mm. Did they get in some type of altercation or was I, it just I doubt it. I think it was unprovoked. random. Yeah. Probably unprovoked. Yeah. yeah. Um, at 15, McKay was diagnosed as a psychopath by psychiatrist, Dr. Leonard Carr, who predicted he would grow up to become a quote, cold psychopathic killer. Some, uh, some foreshadowing there. Wow. Yeah. Apparently. Yeah. Unfortunately, these it. quotes were said many times by doctors early on and they, you know, the justice system just kept putting him back out there, even though he was committing crimes left and right. Yeah, um, he would be removed from his family home on 18 occasions between the age of 12 and 22, and put into various specialist schools, institutions, and prisons. However, whenever his he was away, his mother would always petition to get him back home, where he would carry on beating her and his sisters again, and terrorizing the community. God, I wonder what his sisters thought about this. You know, it's like, mom, no, leave him there, please. <laughs> he needs help, yeah. and we don't want to get beat. Yeah, man. Yeah. I just don't see how you do that to your daughters. It would be interesting to hear quotes from them for sure. Yeah, I would like to hear her her, her explanation for that. I know you love all your children. I, I understand that. But when one of your children is putting your other children in life or death harm, like you have to make a decision there. Mm -hmm. So one of his teachers at a specialist school described him as a potential murderer of women. Some more foreshadowing. Mm-hmm. Um, another described him as a cold, so psychopathic killer, as we mentioned. And in October of 1968, he was committed to the Moss side hospital in Liverpool as a diagnosed psychopath. He would be released in 1972. And this is when the muggings, uh, and all of the petty crimes around London sparked up in all of those affluent areas. Mm -hmm. As he entered adulthood, he developed a fascination with Nazism, calling himself Franklin Bol Bolvault the first and filling his, uh, flat. <laughs> with Nazi Nazi memorabilia and touted himself okay. as being 100% Aryan while being a quarter black, as we mentioned earlier. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah. Well, I guess this is his, uh, this is his outing. You know how like Richard Ramirez went the sata satanic path. Mm -hmm. This was his evil way of going, I guess, right. or justifying what he was doing in some way. Yeah. Even though most of his victims were white, right? Right. <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> affluent areas of London yeah. in the 70s. Uh, yeah, I don't think you're going to find a whole lot of diversity. It, it doesn't really make much sense. Yeah. It doesn't make much sense. But he is a psychopathic killer, so yeah, you have to consider that. Yeah. So he allegedly also frequently spoke about his desire to, quote, wipe out the elderly. And during this time, that he was living obsessive. in London and frequently abusing drugs and alcohol, which only added to it. Um, yep. and so let's get back to 1975 following his arrest for father Crean's murder. Police finally had their man in custody, the guy that had been terrorizing London. And mm -hmm. he's now willingly confessing to not only father Crean's murder, but then unexpectedly confessed to a series of shocking unsolved murders, 13 in total. So they find out wow. that he's one of the most prolific serial killers they'd ever seen in England. Um, and he was more than willing to talk about each one, how he had done it what he had done to these victims. Uh, most of these murders yeah. were unknown to the interviewing officers, but when they checked into the, his descriptions of the killings, they found indeed that, uh, you know, there were people that had been killed and the details of these unsolved murders uh, that occurred around London matched up to his stories. He stated in interviews that his first murder had been that of a 17 year old German girl named Heidi Minick, Minook who was murdered on July 9th, 1973. He said that he had stabbed her on a train before opening the door and throwing her out near Catford. So just a completely wow. horrendous random attack on a young woman that doesn't, yeah. you know, a girl, not even of age. Um, and a German girl at that, that does, that's not very Nazi of him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Right. 
She was apparently so kind I'm of saying, like this guy's uh, all over the place. She's apparently uh, in London as like working as like a caretaker. She would ca- tend mm-hmm. to people's homes and ma- babysit and things like that. And maybe that made it harder for you know police to figure out what had happened to her because she was a foreigner. Right. And um, makes sense. Yeah. So he then said that he had killed a drunk homeless man uh, randomly by throwing him off a bridge into the River Thames in January of 1974 and bragged about it and said that he enjoyed the way that uh, the man had fluttered down just like a bird. He said that he had been approaching this homeless man who was drunk and and he basically said that he was kind of disgusted by him. He was filthy and smelly and just to Mm -hmm. show his disgust, just picked him up and threw him off the bridge. Jesus. How big was this guy? How big was Patrick McKay? I, you know, know, I don't know. Does it say anywhere? I don't know. He looked uh, he looked as though like when you look at his images, he was very slight of frame. Yeah. I do know that. There's he couldn't have been more than mm. he couldn't have been more than 160 pounds. Very mm. slight of frame. Okay. And maybe he was a little taller and lankier, but uh definitely kind of a skinnier fellow. Okay. We have some images in the crime line coming up. Uh, yeah. He also confessed to the murders of 57-year-old Stephanie Britton and her four-year-old grandson. So now you have a child victim, uh, Christopher Martin, on January 12, 1974, saying that he only killed the child as he had been a witness. Um, mm-hmm. And we have a, trying to show a little bit of humanity there, I guess. I suppose. You know this weird how serial yeah. killers we've talked about it. They draw they draw lines sometimes. They draw lines. Yeah, like some of them they don't do. want people thinking they uh, you know sexually abuse children. Some don't. And a lot of times the line mm-hmm. is the children for some reason for them. Right. But it's like you do right. heinous, horrific things to other people. Mm-hmm. Um, quote, the case was initially judged to be a domestic killing, but it closely resembled McKay's modus operandi and a young man matching his description was seen close to the house before before and after the act. Author John Lucas says of the double killing, the, the killing of 57 year old Stephanie Britton and her four year old grandson. And he, right. this man, John Lucas, wrote a book uh, called Britain's Forgotten Serial Killer. Another book that uh, you could use as a resource for this, also only available um, uh, in p- paperback form, not available on audible.com, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, he confessed also to the murder of Frank Goodman on June 13th, 1974, who had been bludgeoned to death in his tobacco shop shortly after it closed, which was subsequently robbed. So it's, you know, it sounds like he hung out in this shop. After closing, he attacked the man to steal a pack of cigarettes is what it sounds like it was over, but also he clearly just wanted to kill someone at that point. Oh yeah. Cause he, yeah, he could have just beat the man up a little bit and took what he wanted. He was an older guy. You didn't need to kill him. Right. Right. Yeah. He then went on to confess to the murder of 92 year old Sarah Rod Rodmel. He had killed her in her flat in Hackney two days before Christmas in 1974, saying that he had nailed the back door shut and put her stockings in her mouth. And a quote about that one was killing her was as easy as washing my socks. Well, she's 92 years old, you sure. piece of shit. Yeah. God almighty. Sound like a real tough guy killing a 92-year-old woman, right? Seriously. He also, I, four, yeah. he's killing four-year-olds, 92-year-old women. What a badass. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. He's very Richard Ramirez in that way, for sure. Mm-hmm. He also confessed to the murder of 48-year-old cafe owner Ivy Davies in South End in February of 1975, saying he killed her by beating her with a tent stake which matched up because police had found that this woman had been beaten to death with some sort of metal bar. And he would say that this wasn't mm-hmm. random, that he had known her and wanted to rob her. So he'd probably like some of the other elderly women befriended her, yeah, gotten close to them and then found his opportunity when they were alone to strike. He was, he was also uh, often heard bragging about Davies murder while in Brixton prison. So a lot of evidence to that one. Um, right. Unfortunately he would, I don't think he would be, he would only be convicted later of three of these killings because there was insufficient evidence and he would later redact his confessions. Of course. We'll get to that. So the three, yeah. other, the three other murders that he confessed to were the 1973 murder of Mary Hines in Kentish Town and the murders of Isabella Griffith and Adele Price in 1974-1975, which we started this case out with, their two murders. Mm-hmm. He said that he felt peculiar in the days leading up to and the days following a murder. Peculiar. Mm-hmm. I bet. Yeah. And a week or so before the murder of Father Crean, Patrick took a set of horrifying images of himself, which gave you a glimpse into the mind of a psychopath. So he went into one of those photo booths alone (laughs) and took pictures of himself. And they are, when you know, they're quite disturbing. They are disturbing because you know, like, this is not, 
someone putting on an act like this is really like a psychopath yeah. at work here. He's a real psychopath. Many faces of a psychopath. It's crazy how they can change. It's kind of Ted Bundy esque, you know how like they can make a face and they look different than they just did. Absolutely. Like just four images. Absolutely. One he's like right. eating like a chicken leg or something, and another one he's yeah. got this just insane animalish. The bottom right one, like he's got like a yeah. animalistic just. Oof. You guys can also check this out on our YouTube page yeah. as well. We'll put these photos up, you know, as as well as all the pictures of things we talk about yeah. on YouTube. Or just type in Patrick ask. McKay photo booth into Google Images and you'll find yeah. the pictures we're talking about. Absolutely. Um, he said that after killing Father Crean, he filled the bathtub and watched him float there for about an hour and a sense of calm came over him. About Isabella Griffith's murder in a later memoir. So he had a memoir too from behind bars, which he went into length oh, yeah. about his murders and everything else. But about uh, Isabella Griffith, he said, quote, she was not a bad soul and why I killed her. I feel I may never know. I suppose that even though I'd killed her, I wanted in death to make her as comfortable as she lay on her kitchen floor. I closed her eyes as though as they were staring lifeless up, covered her as if in a sleeping bag and left her there. These murders were so solemn when I think of them, yet so quick, so fast to take place. Maybe a glimpse of uh, remorse you can sense coming through. I guess it's odd because he goes I quickly guess. from, but that's like, I guess, a kind of a, uh, a psychopath or they're, they're one second. They're fine. The next second they have a, just freak the fuck out. Right. But like right. he'll, he'll go from bragging and saying how easy it was to kill this old woman to, you know, almost like he feels bad. Yeah. That is strange. When police questioned in a, compassion, when police questioned him on his choice of weaponry, he replied, I always carry two knives for, for protection. You know, there are a lot of people around these days, violent in that. <laughs> Indeed. Ain't that the pot calling the kettle black? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Investigators concluded that McKay had been the, the perpetrator of the muggings and theft spree in Chelsea and Kensington uh, back in 72, crimes which were previously unsolved. So they put a stamp on that, and he later redacted his confessions to all but four of the 13 murders that he had claimed to have done, and those would be the murders of Griffith, Price, Crean, and the homeless man that he had thrown from the bridge in January of 1974. And this would mean that there was insufficient evidence to charge him for more than five murders. We're talking about the 70s. His confession right. was all they had because they didn't have other witnesses in most of these. Um, you know that had to be frustrating for the police officers and the people working that case because his confessions matched up so well to the evidence that they yeah. did have. It's one of those things where it's like these, tie it to these murders are unofficially closed. You know, like we know he did it, but we can't charge him with it, basically. But he's going exactly. to prison for the rest of his life regardless. So they were like, eh. Well, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. He might be getting out pretty soon, actually, which is uh, That's perfect terrifying. timing for this case. Police were right. una unable to identify the homeless victim. McKay said he killed in January of 1974. He threw him into the River Thames. Who knows where uh, the homeless man's body ended up? And also, who knows if he actually even died? If he didn't brutally assault him before throwing him off, the man may have just known how to swim quite well and just swam to the edge of the river or got caught on something and walked away. Who knows? Yeah. It's not a maybe. guarantee that he died. Right. That's true. Let's think positive That's very here. true. Yeah. <laughs> and let's get to the trial. Uh, a man named Robin Clark, who was also interviewed in the documentary, quite a quite a face that guy's got. I mean, I don't want to be really mean because maybe something happened to him, but like, yeah, you just got to watch it. Robin Clark is uh, okay. His lower lower half of his face and the way he talks is odd. Um, man, maybe he had a stroke or something. It's almost like he maybe he had like maybe he had a uh, jaw cancer or something like that. I don't know. Oh, okay. But All right. He once again would stand in defense of Patrick McKay and because he was the same defense lawyer that had uh, defended him back with the check, the check fraud thing. Yeah. He stuck by him and he truly believed that Patrick McKay was disturbed and that he could uh, to only control his behaviors to a limited aspect and that he wasn't even culpable for a lot of these murders because he was so disturbed. Right. At his trial in November of 1975, McKay was convicted of manslaughter for the killings of Adele Price, Isabella Griffith, and Father Anthony Crean after pleading guilty on the grounds of diminished responsibility, which mm -hmm. basically like saying he was uh, guilty by reason of insanity is what we would insanity. call it over here. Yeah. Yeah. That's really the only chance he's got at this point is pleading. And honestly, I'm not opposed you know? to that. Like this guy just needs to be institutionalized for eternity until he dies, in my opinion. 
Yeah. Like yeah. a place that can really handle him. Cause I don't same. know if he belongs in prison. He's, he's going to freaking, he's going to hurt one of the staff or, you know, that's just the way I view it. It's like this guy's any chance he gets, he's a psychopath. He's going to plot and plan and he should probably just be, you know, in padded rooms, drugged up probably where he should well, be. Well, the good, the good thing about him being in prison though, there's a lot less, uh, you know, defenseless victims in prison. Yeah, no doubt. The guards, yeah. the other prisoners. You know what I'm saying? There ain't there ain't many 92 year old women that you can just abuse in here. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you're gonna have to earn your earn your kills up in here. Yeah, you know what I'm but saying? But I think he'd just be heavily heavily medicated, really. You know? Yeah, probably. Which is there? You probably. know, psychi psychiatric places are better for that than the prison. Need like a Charles Bronson character in there just to beat the shit out of him. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So due to the due to insufficient evidence, he was not convicted of the murders of Goodman or Hines, but the cases were left on file um, and police would later find evidence which uh, proved that he had killed Frank Goodman. That was the shop owner, uh, the tobacco shop owner that he, he had like kicked to death in the store. That's right. And he would be sentenced yeah. to life imprisonment with a mi minimum of 20 years. And his defense team would plead uh, had pleaded insanity, but medical experts instead concluded that he was a psychopath, which they say was a personality disorder and not a mental disorder. So you're walking a fine line there. Yeah, really? Yeah. I mean, where does your personality come from? Right. <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So he had been repeatedly denied full release by the parole board. Yeah. We're not med We're not experts on mental health. So let's just make that known. No, absolutely yeah, we'll not. leave that up yeah. to the experts. I don't want anybody getting too upset. All I my you heard my take. I think he should be institutionalized and medicated. He's a dangerous to the public yeah. for eternity. I mean, he showed in from the time he yes. was a child, uh, you know, torturing animals, and then into his teen years, trying to kill a child, mm -hmm. and then basically going on to kill as many defenseless human beings as he could. Yeah, this is a, a desire that's not going away in him. Yeah. So in 2017, he was permitted to move to an open prison with day release provisions. That's oh, scary. Lord. And then in June of 2020, he uh, he had now changed his name to David Groves and was again being considered for release. However, the hearing parole board was postponed amidst a fresh investigation into McKay's involvement in the murders to which he had previously confessed and which he was still suspected of having committed. Um, and no one else has been arrested for those murders that he had confessed to um, because it sounds like he was the one that did them. So, yeah, he did them. Um, nonetheless, in May of 2021, the parole board announced he would be he would uh, not be eligible for release, but could remain in prison conditions. And in July of 2022, it was revealed that McKay could be released on parole within weeks with a parole hearing scheduled for November 30th, 2022. Oh my God. So next month. That is terrifying. Yeah. And he is now an open prison, as we mentioned it, uh, but is more likely to re be released. The son of Ivy Davies, one of his victims said that he was outraged by the announcement that he was unable to give an account to the parole board of the impact of McKay's crimes as McKay was not convicted of her murder. Commenting, he stated, quote, everyone knows he did more. He hasn't shown any remorse, but there's not a lot I can do about it. Uh, for now, mm -hmm. while he's still in prison, he is Britain's longest serving prisoner, having been in prison for 47 years. And he has some quotes about when he first, uh, you know, when he was first arrested and before his sentencing, his idea of prison life and what he was looking towards. He said he could see himself spending the rest of his life behind bars, writing in his memoir, quote, my life was wasted. I now realize that is, it is now wasted forever to rot. Something terrible had come along in order to reveal the decaying disaster that my life has been since 1962. You know, when I look at myself now, I could put a bullet through my head and through my brain for the kind of blood, bloody life that I have lived. Uh, but mm. I do not know who would be, who would do me that service. I have often thought to myself, lots of people. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> like, uh, the, the grandson of the victim that we just talked about. Right. He, he would probably love to do that for you. Yeah. Quote, I have often thought to myself whenever I'm alone, that it would be the best thing I ever could have done. Wow. But you didn't. Right. Like so many psychopaths. Instead, you just killed you know, a lot of other innocent out. people rather than yourself. Yep. Yep. What a case. Man. What a story. Seriously. Uh, Great Britain's Richard Ramirez, right? Yeah. Or the UK, London's Brit, uh, Richard Ramirez, rather. Or Herbert Mullen. Man. He had some similarities to him, too. I, I, didn't Herbert Mullen yeah. also storm into a church and kill a priest brutally? I think so. I think that I think was so. his coup de grace at the end. Yeah. He kind of felt like uh, the priest was 
was onto him or something. I think he thought I don't know, pre- he was he, he, Herbert was gone from like far too much LSD and stuff. Oh, and, like yeah. he was hearing uh, voices and yeah. yeah, hearing the die song. Remember mm-hmm. that? Yeah, yeah, man, he's something else, bro. Yeah, you know what else is something Oof. else? All What's natural that? deodorant, like oh my Gaia in your That's armpits. True. Nothing better than that. That's true. So much better. <laughs> Oh my guy is an innovative all natural deodorant fragrance and beard oil company specializing in paraben and aluminum free products. And their innovative line of deodorants inhibit the growth of odor causing bacteria while still maintaining effectiveness. And at Oh My Gaia, they use only all natural paraben and aluminum free organic ingredients. And guys, there's tons of scents to choose from at ohmygaia.com. You can check out vanilla, cherry almond, sandalwood, lavender, lemongrass, Egyptian musk, coconut, dream sickle, leather, lumberjack, honeysuckle, fireside. Uh, barbershop, sailor, sweet pea, pear, and also we have our own scent uh, for true crime guys. You can check out True Crime Pine. It has uh, me and Lauren's head mug shots on there from our very, very early True Crime Guys logo, um, and it's a great unisex scent. It's a great place to start. There's also beard oils and scented oils in all of these scents. And because you're True Crime Guys listeners, you can use the code CREEPER for 15% off your order. That's C-R-E-E-P-E-R. And you can get 15% off your order at shop underscore ohmygaia on Instagram or ohmygaia.com, which is O-H-M-Y-G-A-I-A dot com. Again, that's code word CREEPER, guys. You will not regret it. Check it out. It's beard oil season as well. Uh, Men out there who are doing No Shave November, get yourself some Oh My Gaia beard oil. I'm amazed by go. how soft it makes your beer when you really oil that thing up and comb it. Makes a big difference. Yeah, smells good too. Yeah, it smells good too. It's nice to have that beard oil and that mustache. Mm, just mm-hmm. Go around smelling good stuff all day. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's also talk about our other weekly sponsor, an all-natural product and uh, provider, Tonic CBD. Tonic's farm-to-bottle yes. CBD plus botanical blends are uniquely formulated to provide targeted support where you need it most. Each and every high-quality ingredient is thoughtfully selected for its ability to support and enhance the benefits of CBD, resulting in a more effective, well-rounded, and consistent wellness solution for your mind and body. They have a bunch of different blends depending on your needs. Chill Tonic's my favorite. That's basically all I order mm-hmm. at this point. Uh, the, um, the droppers for nighttime, about an hour before bed, help you just relax and sink into bed. Uh, wipes away anxiety. Yeah. It has ashwagandha, lemon balm, and passion flower to, to deliver a super calming effect. Uh, and they also use black seed oil, which is a powerful antioxidant and it's great for your immune mm-hmm. system, but that just scratches the surface of what their superfood can do. So it's really cool to see that they, unlike a lot of other companies are combining superfoods with CBD. Um, and you can also verify the quality of their products by tapping your phone on the microchip on the top of the packaging to provide you with lab reports, product information, details about their farm and helpful blog posts to provide you with more education on CBD. So with values rooted in quality, integrity, and sustainability, Tonic is committed to creating a plant-based wellness product that is good for you, good for the planet. Visit tonicvibes.com to you to learn more and use code word creeper for 20% off your order. That's tonicvibes.com, code word creeper for 20% off. Right on. Two great companies, guys. We love to support 100%. these companies. We're happy to have them as partners. We basically and, work for uh, products. We, we both use, We're not even getting Yeah, we both use their products yeah. uh, every day. Yeah. So we're not endorsing something that we don't believe in. Mm-hmm. If you guys are looking for a, a quality CBD company or a quality natural deodorant, please check out Oh My Gaia and Tonic. They'll do you right for sure. Quickly, we haven't done right. we haven't done what this. Else do we, got? we haven't done this in a while. I'm gonna quickly run through some uh, reviews. People that have taken the time to do okay, this, we cool. appreciate it. So you guys deserve yes, a shout out. Um, although this one's gonna be a tough shout out here. <laughs> it's just a bunch of letters, to be honest with you. God, just it's yeah. dot, 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 like someone fell on their keyboard and fell asleep on it or something or had a seizure. Ah, that uh, in the U.S. says uh, this show is has too much content and I want more banter and songs. Okay. Uh, then we <laughs> got never heard that before. We got Nina ninety five says too many tangents. I've been listening to this podcast for a few weeks. I do enjoy there them. There you go. I think the guys go off on too many. T- <laughs> See, this is perfect. We got one that says That's more the tangents opposite. and one that says not enough. Uh, you can't win, bro. You yeah. can't win. Yeah. I've uh, started old, uh. listening to the older episodes though, so they hopefully they get back. They, be, they get better with this otherwise great podcast they have great balance of lightheartedness without being obnoxious or disrespectful so thank you nina 95 we'll take that constructive criticism but it's tough because other people say we don't do enough tangents so, yeah it's tough it yeah really to is. an extent i don't know what to tell you we're gonna we're gonna be us i do think we go on less tangents than we used to so she said she's listening to the older episodes it's yeah. possible that you know it, you know you'll notice a difference i think we used to go on a lot more for sure i agree 
Um, let's also say thank you to Matt Pratt, who says, I've listened to a few podcasts, but this one ha has made its way into my daily listens. I was recommended this one because of my information and banter from my girlfriend's mom. Quoting form, quoting my form of humor matches Michael's. She was right. Love this show. Looking forward to setting up my Patreon account once I finish all the episodes. Only three left to go. Keep creeping. And oh, my guy is the bomb. Right on. Yep. I know. Great review. Thank you. Another shout out from Just Fran 78. Awesome podcast. Keep up the great work. Five stars. Thank you. Uh, Tarasi says, this is such a great podcast. I started list, started with Sandu, but ran out of episodes. So I came over here and I am not disappointed. Definitely in my top three podcasts. Keep, uh, keep it up. You delightful weirdos. Nice. Thank you. Uh, Sandu is Strange and Unexplained, guys. It's yeah. another show that we have on free platforms wherever you listen. Strange and Unexplained by True Crime Guys. You can check that out as well. Mm-hmm. One more. Jenny Liz right. says, I listen to love it. Five stars. I listen to you guys every night for my night shift at work. I usually avoided murder podcasts because the stories would freak me out. I get stuck on scary thoughts like Lauren, <laughs> but you guys deliver <laughs> scary stories comically where I want to hear them. My last name is Hicks and I died laughing at the last pirate podcast when Lauren explained Hicks's appearance with your accents. Please don't ever stop the accents. They are hilarious. I love my, oh my Gaia, by the way. And I'll soon be a part of Patreon. Nice. Yeah, baby, let's go. Nothing beats a good old podcast like music, amazing accents, and the comical close friendship and crime stories. Keep it up, guys. Your friend, Jenna Gump. Oh, it's Jenna Gump. Oh, Jenna. Jenna. Right on. Thanks, Jenny. I don't know. There's more, man. Thank you, everybody. I'll just like, without reading the shout outs, I'll just say thank you to Heidi True Crime 71, Twinks, yeah. uh, Odd Vegan, uh, Rock Femme KC. I think that's where we left off last time was Rock Femme KC. So we're all caught up. Okay. And if you're Thank not you caught up on all of our content, go over to uh, patreon.com slash true crime guys, $2 a month, get you access to our once a month Patreon exclusive, like last week's episode. And right. if you want to go to the $5 tier, you get everything that we make, all of the Sandu stories. I mean, you, you name it. If we made it, it's on there for $5 a month. And you can pay That's up right. front for 54 bucks and save 10% if you don't like the monthly charge of $5 coming off your card. But yeah. Yes. Also on the $2 tier, you can listen to all of our early episodes. Um, yep. Episodes one through fifty have been put into the vault. You get the code to the vault, to man. Save some room. Yeah, so you get access to the vault at uh, at the two dollar tier as well, plus all the Patreon exclusives. Right. So, all right, that about does all it. Right. Uh, I think we'll see you guys next week. But it, by then, Halloween will have happened. So everybody have a great Halloween. Stay safe mm -hmm. out there. Um, yeah, get lots of candy. I guess I don't know what else to tell you. That's it. Yeah. Keep creeping. Keep creeping. I guess. Yes, keep creeping on Halloween for sure. That's right. All right. See you. All right. We'll see you guys. From the minds of true crime guys, come TCG Weekly. If you've enjoyed this episode, please feel free to check out all the other programs on the TCG Network. Every Wednesday, a new episode of True Crime Guys proper, Strange and Unexplained on Mondays, and Full House Fantasy Football on Fridays to start your weekend. And if those aren't enough, head on over to our Patreon account, where you can have access to hundreds of hours of content, including older episodes and other Patreon exclusives like Strange Shorts, Sandu Stories, Higher Thoughts, and the 5-Minute Murder Show. But until next time, guys, keep creeping. Hey, uh, how, do you, how do you shut this thing off? Over? You hush your mouth, boy.